integrating them with prior information that's already in our head. So that's exactly what germane cognitive load is all about, is that work that we do to take new information and put it into all of the schemas and all of the, the um, ideas that we already have in our head from our prior learning. Um, so you might uh, right now remember back to those slides about working memory and long-term memory and think about how germane cognitive load relates to those slides. That Doing that work is itself germane cognitive load. All right, so we've got three types. Intrinsic, it's inherent to the task, the only thing that we can do as instructors is try to break things down and simplify it a little bit, but some tasks are definitely harder than others. Extraneous cognitive load, things that we as instructors add on to the task that sometimes make it more difficult to learn. And then the thing that we really want learners to do is germane cognitive load, which is taking in new information and integrating it with what's already in our head. And that's the important work of learning. That's where we want learners to be focused and not on this extraneous cognitive load, things that don't matter to the task, um, but that actually make us work a lot harder to process new information. So um, if we think about swimming, uh, let's go back to that example. So there's some in really difficult intrinsic cognitive load about remembering to breathe and stay alive at the same time as we're trying to move forward and swim. That's intrinsic to the task. But one thing you might do to reduce that is to learn about being in the water and just uh, breathing and staying afloat before you start moving yourself forward in the water. So there are some things we can do to help with the intrinsic cognitive load. There's extrinsic cognitive load, maybe if you have swimmers around you diving and jumping and splashing uh, that distract you from learning the task, um, maybe what you need is to remove all of those things and to put yourself in a quiet environment where you're only focused on yourself and only focused on your own swimming. So we could reduce extraneous cognitive load. And then the load, and this one might be a little bit hard to think about in swimming, but let's take a second. Maybe your instructor could talk to you about how to um, uh, think about uh, ways to calm yourself while you're swimming, and that's going to help you process that, that those different types of things that you have to do while you're swimming. The instructor could um, remind you of things that you've learned previously about swimming while you're taking your next steps. Um, germane cognitive load, I think, maybe is more relevant when we're talking about academic subjects. Um, but we have to remember these three different types in order to be able to figure out how to reduce the extraneous cognitive load, help learners um, really focus on that germane cognitive load, and to help learners manage the intrinsic cognitive load of difficult tasks. Um, and that is where we're going to move with Tabitha next as we start thinking about Mayer's multimedia principles, which each focus on one of these three things, reducing extraneous load, simplifying the intrinsic load, or supporting learners in doing that processing, that deep thought that they need to do in order to help them with that germane cognitive load. So we're going to come back to those three ideas at the end while we, after we talk through these principles and I remind ourselves about how these principles relate to that idea of cognitive load. So Tabitha, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure, Amy. So, uh, like I said, we've done this before and I'm not teaching today, you guys are. So for principles, because you're, there are 12 and thank God y'all are 12, you're gonna have, I'm going to select a startup to explain the principle as it is on the screen. So, hmm, you know, you're all that. So the first startup to go up with multimedia is going to be in Temata. Tell us about this principle.
you can kill me later, Gilbert and Frida, but for now, <laughs> you're the ones who are going first, so I'm waiting. Can, can we go third? <laughs> Nobody will want to go first, though. Okay, uh, can you. you go third? Okay. Yeah. The next person doesn't get to to refuse. Let me see. Let me see. Actually, this should be easy for bachelor lessons. They're the ones who and Loho, one of them. Loho, bachelor lessons. Uh, I'll go with Loho. So Loho, you're taking this on multimedia. You're working on this a lot. So explain this principle about how you're what with it. Yeah. Thank you uh, for that. Though, yeah, we are caught up now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me read and then I'll explain. So, mm -hmm. multimedia. So, the multimedia principle states that human learn best from words and pictures than just words alone. So, a uh, graphic should not be an afterthought. They should be planned alongside the text to maximize understanding. Decorative uh, graphics do not improve learning. So um, basically from our side, uh, this applies to us and uh, we put, yes, we also upload the, the videos and um, we don't do it every uh, like in every content that we put. We only put where we feel that this is necessary. Again, all of us we have been learners, but uh, so uh, we put ourselves in the shoe of the learner and get to see if I was a learner in class, uh, is uh, would this work for me? Is it working for me? So we uh, put ourselves in the shoe of the learner and yes this one uh, decorative graphics do not improve learning uh, basically sometimes we have too much of a good thing and when we talk about too much of a good thing it it becomes destructive and the learners are just getting to check how they look how beautiful they are and then there is no learning that is happening so even as we put the graphics and put the, the the multimedia, we should be able to put them in places where uh, is very necessary and also alongside the text so that they can be able to understand even as they read, then they can be able to visualize exactly what they are reading. I hope I have been... I'm clapping. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> Good Thank job, you. Priscilla, considering uh, that was an ambush. So I'm not even going to add anything to that. You've done a very good job. Uh, we'll skim through them and then give you feedback after the activity that comes next. So now we'll go to... Uh, Tabitha, yes, Amy, go. Sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you, but yes. I wonder actually if we mm -hmm. might think about... Um, I know we're going to talk about the integration later, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. maybe for the first couple it's worth thinking about cognitive load alongside it so if you mm -hmm. slide mm -hmm. i wonder if anybody can guess about what this principle does for cognitive load for either intrinsic cognitive load, extrinsic cognitive load, or main cognitive load does it impact any of those three cognitive load just yes Diana mm -hmm. might be mm -hmm. maybe it can in some cases it can be a distraction somehow especially when you have a lot of maybe a video and still you still have some images or a tutor on the side so it can be a distraction. So which type of load? Uh, okay, so we... Extraneous. Extraneous. Yes. Uh, Extraneous. Before we give feedback, Marisa? Well, I'm just thinking about if you have a concept displayed in an image that is really relatable to the audience, so maybe shows it applied into something that they do in their daily life, 
then when they think about that principle, they'll think about that image and then think about how they use it. And so it can help relate the new topic to their already exist, their existing like daily life. Very good. Anyone else want to add anything? All right. Well, thanks for uh, <laughs> our brave volunteers. Yeah. So, um, oh, okay. We've got a comment to reinforce multimedia, multimedia principle. Mm -hmm. In real uh -huh. life, when you meet somebody you interacted to many years ago, a person will first recognize the image before thinking about the name. This implies that human beings learn best from pictures and words. Yeah, so you guys hit on uh, two important things here. One is that if you have decorative graphics, doing is adding to extraneous cognitive load. So if you have graphics that have really nothing to do with the information that you're trying to learn, they might increase that load on the learner and we don't we don't want them to have extra burden to learn something. So that's why there's a problem with decorative graphics. They're paying attention, as you said, they're paying attention to something else and not the learning that we want them to have. On the other hand, a picture that relates to the topic that helps structure the information in some way that can help them relate it to their lives, then it can help them with that germane cognitive load. It helped them connect it to what they already know and it can help them process it more easily. So that's uh, why we have this multimedia principle is that we can help people process information better and faster with germane cognitive load. But importantly, we need to not add extraneous load here. And we might actually even be able to do a third thing with this uh, principle which is to help simplify a little bit that intrinsic cognitive load. So if you have a really good picture, some sort of graphic that helps break things down, oh, like go back to your periodic table example. Try, imagine trying to learn the periodic table without a picture. <laughs> Uh, it would just be a whole huge amount of information and you wouldn't have sort of anywhere um, to, to help you simplify that information and guide you on where to look. And so using a good picture along with your words can help also to reduce that um, intrinsic difficulty of the task by simplifying it down, by letting you focus on just one line column or just one row. Uh, Marissa, question, question or comment? Yeah, what does something like a jingle, like the ABCs, for example, like there's a song for it to help mm -hmm. kids memorize it. What does that fit into? Uh, of the three cognitive low yeah. uh Let's see, a song that helps people learn. Um, uh, so in this case, would I say that's uh, that's a good question? Helping, I don't think it's reducing the complexity of the task because the task is still the same. So it's not reducing the intrinsic cognitive load. In theory, it's not adding extrinsic cog cognitive load. So I would say that it's helping you with the processing. It's helping you with that germane cognitive load, probably by um, um uh giving you some way to sort of repeat it easily over and over associations now just the abc the alphabet but you also have the tones that you use to sing and that's something that humans are inherently already good at and so that's why it doesn't re increase the difficulty but it helps you with the processing so i would say that that jingle that song is helping you uh, with the germane cognitive load by helping you remember it and be able to repeat it more often. Yeah, great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great way to help people with the processing. 
Uh, okay, sorry, Tabitha. I just wanted to help us start making those connections from the very beginning. I'll turn it back to you. Oh, but you did. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, uh, Amy. Moving right along to conti contiguity, so spatial. I'm going to, so it says humans learn best when relevant text and visuals are physically, is the word here, physically close together. So again, I'll go to someone who's doing content. So that was Loho, so this one will do virtual lessons. Someone explain this to us and then give us an example of how this plays out in your product. Yeah, <clears throat> let me try to decode uh, this concept. <clears throat> so, um, contiguity, spatial, humans learn best when relevant texts and visuals are physically close together. I think my understanding is that uh, we are trying to localize uh, the context of the content that we are making available to the learner to make them more practical, more fun, and more engaging uh, to learn. Okay, Diana, go. To add on what Julius just said, uh, I think this principle actually apart from what do you call it? we when creating our content to ensure that the text are close to whatever is being described at that moment for example if i'm giving a description of a certain image it should be close to that image or even the feedback should come immediately after whatever we have whatever we are being asked so that is I, the way i understand is actually it's about the text and how how the text is brought closer or immediate feedback or tied to the to the task great job diana and so say um it's a diagram of one I'm coming to you, Gilbert, thank you. So say it's a diagram of the brain. Um, tell me what uh, it looks like when it's when you're doing a good job and then when you're not, and then how, what, what, uh, what, which of the three uh, I'll be working with here, which type of cognitive load do you think is in play here? So say we have a picture of a brain and the text, like you said, is not close together. What happens then for the learner? If the text is far from the brain, and most, for example, most of the images of our brain is so complex, I think the intrinsic factor is being, I don't know, is being experienced there because if the image is far from whatever I'm explaining, it means there'll be a distract. There'll, the explanation will not be, I don't know, it will be a distraction. I'm going to find the image where it is and finding the explanation where I can find where it is. So I think the first. So you're saying, um, yeah, so it's intrinsically hard just because of the subject matter, which is the brain. And then uh, it's extraneous if you're putting the words far away so that, the, so that then the learner has to go far away to refine, come back. You're stressing them, you're adding, uh, you're adding work where there shouldn't be any, so that's extraneous. Uh, before Amy jumps in, Gilbert, comment. Uh, yeah, I think I just wanted to iterate what uh, the last presenter just said. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the alphabetic, the alphabet chart when you were younger and learning, mm -hmm. where you have the R for apple and Z for zebra. So, so you have the image and you have the words right mm -hmm. below yeah. it or next to it. Mm -hmm. That way, every time when you're doing revision like with your parents 
they, all they need to do is to point at the image and you will say apple or yeah Alexandra or mm -hmm. whatever whatever it was yeah mm -hmm. so i think it it, it actually it, uh, speaks more of the intrinsic cognitive load because it simplifies the process of understanding what what uh, information is being passed uh, across okay great anyone else want to jump in before amy wraps up then we move to the next one anyone else okay amy oh, oh sorry priscilla okay go okay so uh, i am thinking on the on the content part there when when we were we were learning when we were in school we used to have uh, an image then we have a couple of questions about the image so you move to the next page you still come back to the other page to look for the image for you to relate with the question that you are you are doing so what uh, this tells me is that i should have the image and the text together even mm -hmm. if we are having 10 questions and we are having 10 questions under the same image then we should have the image all through to ensure that the learner is able to look at the image and answer the question there and then instead of going back to and having to sleep yeah, yeah 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 i get what you're saying amy yes yeah great explanation guys so this one is really about reducing extraneous cognitive load so it actually doesn't make the material itself any simpler if you move if you have an image over here and text over here it doesn't make the the uh physics or the language any simpler to move them together but what it does is to reduce that extra step that people have to take to look from one to the other and to check that they uh, make sense and that they're um you know connected to one another putting them next to each other just reduces that extra step that people have to do so this one is all about reducing extraneous cognitive load good job great uh person whose name i still can't pronounce dixon let's go with dixon <laughs> go mm -hmm. is it related to dual channels and limited capacity i think it helps learners so the if you go back to slide or to uh, principle one one mm -hmm. images and yeah exactly mm -hmm. what you're saying so mm -hmm. that is about helping learners through dual channel nice work remembering all of that uh, um uh understanding of the brain the the uh, cognition that learners are going through that we talked about last time dual channel theory and having um uh your visual field as well as your auditory field this is exactly what helps learners do that processing that germane load of processing by using words and images together the point about bringing them close to each other is just about making it reducing that challenge of having to look back and forth yeah but we are going to be covering uh the dual channels i think in two or three it's coming so that's a great point, Dixon. Uh, Temata said they want to go third. So contiguity temporal. So human humans learn best when corres corresponding words and visuals are presented together instead of in consecutive order. If you're introducing a new process, the animation or visual should be occurring at the same time as the voice over audio. This is preferred to having the voice over play first and then watching visual after. And Temata, though I don't know if, hmm, this is not very you in terms of what you're doing with your Thank product, you but do you wanna that. go? <laughs> Thank you for realizing that. Um, or whomever else is in your team on here, you guys are doing this. So explain to us about voiceovers and visuals and what you think this principle is saying. Uh, and then relate that to cognitive overload. Over to you, uh, Rulings. So, uh, uh, what, I'll, what I'll talk about, I think, uh, has already been presented here. 
uh, mm -hmm. that human learns better, learn best when the corresponding words and uh, visuals are uh, presented together. So at uh, Izielimu, and the and the content that we have been working on, if I can just uh, show the content that we have been working on, uh, we have tried as much as possible to integrate uh, both the instruction and uh, and the animation that come with it. So you'll find that uh, in our lessons as the teacher uh, is instructing at the same time, for example, the teacher is instructing grade one students over color red. At the same time, uh, we are also showing visual and animation of the color red. If uh, it's fruits, we are also, we are also showing at the, at the same time. So this is to uh, avoid uh, distracting the students so that uh, when a teacher is talking about colors, then we let them talk about color, then uh, show later. No, for I think uh, the way we are approaching this, this is uh, as we are doing the video, at the same time, we are also showing the animations that uh, come with it. Though I know that, uh, and uh, I think I'll be able, uh, I, I would want to ask a question here. Uh, if uh, w w what is just a minute, I'm, I'm going mm -hmm. to ask uh, in the if this uh, if this part, uh, sorry, just a minute. Oh, wow. Fire your internet, people, please. Fire them all. <laughs> yeah, I think we have a problem <laughs> here. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. I, I, I needed to show you guys uh, how, how I'm displaying the notes versus the instruction if, uh, mm -hmm. and, and what your comments will be. Uh, you want to try one more time before you give up? And then if not, then you could see us. We could stay on later, then you could show us. I you could try I'm, one more time, then if it refuses, then you will stay on. I'm, I'm Marisa, actually, I see your hand. I'm coming to you. I'm actually already there. So this, this is the instruction part. But uh, we have presented the, the lesson notes uh, down here. And how that works. Uh, uh, if uh, we are distracting our users, that a user instead of watching this video will first of all go down to read the notes. Though, though the notes is not a transcript of what the, the video is saying, but I still feel that probably here uh, we could be introducing extraneous cognitive load on our learners at, uh, at this point. So uh, what will be your comments on, on that? Um, I'll go, Amy, you want to go first or should I go first? Um, I, if you have some thoughts, go for it. <laughs> okay. I do have thoughts. Um, I think both are necessary. So let's just start from there. You need both uh, things, but I think, uh, you need to find a way to collapse the bottom so that I'm, I'm not already choosing between what I need to do first. Um, find a way to ensure that, um, what you're showing in the bottom is reinforcing what's at the top uh, so that they are also not competing in terms of um, it's the same exact information that I'm reading at the top and at the bottom. Reinforce right. what the, what's, what, whatever you feel like needs reinforcing um, in the video, have it at the bottom, but also collapse it so that there's a more button where the first thing I see is the video and that's the thing I'm focused on. And then should I need more information, then I can click on the more bot button and then see... Um, the, the information, the rest of the information you have there. It's also a lot of information. We need to work on your presentation there. It's quite um, right. busy. Right. The presentation is quite busy. I'm going to pause there and let Amy plug in her thoughts. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's a lot of extraneous cognitive mm -hmm. load happening there where learners have to go back and forth, figure out mm -hmm. where it is, where that they're looking for uh, and be able to make that selection in a way that isn't actually helping them do any any type of task. So uh, there are definitely ways we can help you to reduce that extraneous cognitive load. Um, 
Um, Marissa has a mm -hmm. question or comment. No, just back to I. Well, I don't remember the slide. If you, it's it's bit it was to the slide that you were showing. I think it was okay, the cognitive mm -hmm. thing. Like, can you put the cognitive temporal slide back on? Okay. <laughs> I think it was the principle, it was the idea that, I don't see it yet, but I think it's the yeah. idea that the video and the audio should, the, the video and the text should align. Was that right? Yeah, the audio and, yeah, the audio and the video, watching the visuals yeah. should align, yes. I mean, so the way that I would say that we do it, I just spent a lot of time putting like, painstakingly aligning audio of like 10 different languages to the same video. <laughs> and the, the, the reason that I spent all that time is because like the video doesn't have all the information somebody needs to know. Mm -hmm. And the, it really does more of that, um, you know, germane, um, I think where it's mm -hmm. like helping them relate it to things that they see and things that mm -hmm. like experiences they had. Mm -hmm. So if you were to not have them line up right, then when somebody that that germane kind of learning wouldn't really work because as they try to recall in their mind you know uh what it was that they learned like it would be it, they it would they might still have the text they might still have sorry, the voiceover but wouldn't correctly it, they, they wouldn't have the the boost the lift from the image that they would get if it's completely aligned that's the way i, would, I see it Okay, and then I, I, think, I don't know if it's right or not, it's my <laughs> intuition. I mean, yeah, this definitely, you're, you're trying also for people to not have to choose. Um, so I had something and then you showed it to me later. Um, so now I'm working backwards, trying to figure out what exactly you said goes with what. It's just, it's, 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 it's pretty much what you're trying to explain, trying to reduce the amount of work that goes into storing this information, basically. Uh, Amy, I'll let you wrap this up so we can move on. We are a little behind on time. It's three. And yes. most of the activity. Very good. So let's wrap I this one up. Yeah. You, you're all hitting on the idea as well that by fixing one of these types of cognitive loads, you're often fixing the other two as well. So what Rich Mayer, who developed these principles over many, many years and hundreds of experiments, uh, what he, what he uh, would say for this principle based on his studies is that what you're doing with this principle is reducing the extraneous load. But the reason he says that is because um, videos, uh, the, the audio and the visual together helps boost germane cognitive load, Marissa, which is what you're saying. And when you're separating those out in time, you, you don't get that boost immediately. You have to do more work to put the two together. So the overall idea is that even if you have the audio and the visual, you're, you're creating that germane cognitive load of helping learners connect things. But when you separate them in time, you're increasing the, the work that learners have to do to put the two together. So I think you're rightly noting that by increasing the extraneous cognitive load, you're also reducing the germane cognitive load and they kind of work together. What the official word that Rich Mayer would say is that the number one thing this is doing is reducing extraneous cognitive load, but it also doesn't help with the germane cognitive load either. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's move to the next one. Um, so number four is modality. So learners will learn better when the information ex is explained by audio narration than on-screen text, especially, and this is an emphasis here, where the graphic is complex. So hmm, let me see who's going up next. So I'm looking at all generating content before I move on to I'm going to pick on Kiko here. Kiko, please explain modality to us, even though <laughs> I know the technicalities of the content generation on your end. But yes, Kiko, go. Um 
I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of even looking at, at a, the first thing that they definitely understand is what they can try to follow is what people who know how to speak are doing rather than when you're telling them to um, to read to listen more to conversations um, and capture that well or, or like the first thing that keeps your mind is for example from a, from a voice or like a conversation rather than when you're being taught to kind of like read and start start processing that and I think maybe and this could be also be scientific I might be wrong um, the, the ears have a more powerful um, like hearing is more powerful than than eyesight um, in terms of how the brain processes that it, it's somewhere I just read that and that might be my my explanation but I might be wrong uh, but happy to to receive feedback Okay, Kiko. Uh, anyone else want to jump in here before we do? Anyone else wants to say what they're doing with this? Explain. There we go. Frida, go right ahead. Uh, I just want to add to what Kiko has said. Uh, I like his example for toddlers. I, I think we are told the first uh, the first thing that you learn uh, in the womb when you're in your mother's womb is hearing so <laughs> so audio audio really improves the way you learn uh, new information uh, before even you start seeing uh, so our our hearing is better it it reduces the no it simplifies how you express how you process and understand new information so when 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 you when you're in the and you put an audio like I used to do when I was teaching uh, my accounting students at the university it was easier because accounting is so complex and you have to explain a process uh, of how to create the balance sheet and all and but when you give it when you when you give them an audio uh, an explanation from a CEO uh, who's done it and is approving that information they grasp it faster so it makes yeah it makes the information uh clearer and better well understood by the learner okay frida so we are all agreeing that we love listening um to audio the, the one thing here that i want to stress is we are saying that if you're learning something that's difficult so the graphic is something complicated right it's better for you to have an audio narration than for you to have on-screen text so if i'm watching i'm looking at a picture of something that i'm trying to see it's an aeroplane and you're explaining a cockpit to me it's much easier for me to grasp what i you're teaching me if i'm listening and looking at the picture than if i'm listening and then there's text uh, just sort of flying by and I'm still looking at a very graphic picture. So what we're trying to do here is reducing the load that comes from on-screen text that is unnecessary if I'm already listening and looking at a, graph at a complex um, graphic representation of whatever it is. that on-screen text unless it's completely necessary where we already have a graphic is just adding to the load it's I just it's increasing the amount of work the person has to do to take everything in at the same time Amy wrap this one up in two minutes and then we can yes yeah so one way I think of this uh, principle is I think about movies that I watch with subtitles if you have a movie on and you have subtitles below it, where do you look? You have to read, you look at the subtitles, you read the subtitles. And so you often miss a lot of what's happening in the action of the movie. So if it's possible, sometimes it's not. If you think about movies and subtitles, you need, sometimes you need them because you don't mm -hmm. understand the language. But if it's a language... If um, my ears in it information in both ways. Okay. Number five is redundancy. 
humans learn humans learn best with and graphics as opposed to narration and text uh, presented together so the theory here is that if you already have narration and graphics then the text on top is just redundant information i think this one we could uh, i think we all understand what you're saying here unless someone has a question it's 308 uh because we are going to let you guys do these things practically so if you're not paying attention you about to break you guys into groups and you're going to come back and show us what you understood so we're saying uh if you already have narration so someone is speaking and you have graphics then adding text on top is just redundant everything else that's redundant it's not just text it's additional icons pictures anything that that is this that might distract from the actual point um of what i'm looking at if if it doesn't absolutely have to be there then remove it so every time you're creating a slide you're trying to teach something if the the boy does not have to have red shoes with an uh, with a yellow heel and uh, you know those small small things you go add and then another arrow on top and then another thing comes flying from the the, the stop it's redundant it's taking away it might look pretty to you and it's fun to do but it's taking away from the point of this, which is to for, for them to focus on the right things. I'm going to go to number six now. Um, that's coherence. Humans learn best when extraneous. Distracting material is not included. Adding material that does not support the instructional goal. Again, we've covered that. Uh, seven. Um, I want to spend more time on the ones that are... So humans learn best when they are shown exactly what to pay attention to on the screen so for this one i'm going to go with syllable what do you think this one is saying and how 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 are you doing it in your product um you want links based on their shown exactly you are not at the deep dive so feel free to say you you don't it's fine. I can't okay, so yeah, sure. like you, like, you want to pass? I don't know. Okay, just wanted to contribute a little bit, but okay. not related to product because you know, product we mainly uh, provide the infrastructure where people they mm -hmm. share the material so we don't have so much. <laughs> like when you're preparing for exam and teacher just say, hey, focus on this to that. Is this closer to that? Um, technically, uh, let me, before I give you an answer, I, Gilbert didn't go, did he? Did Gilbert answer? No. Gilbert, this one is yours. You exams that you're giving people assessments. So tell us what this one means. Humans <laughs> learn best when they are shown exactly what to pay attention to on the screen. How might you do this at Intermata? So basically, I think in the in in case of assessment is mm -hmm. is basically the the instructions that are given to the to the students. So in our system, for example, before before the student sits for that exams, when they log in, the first thing they 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 meet is actually the instruction that has been provided by the teacher on on how they should focus on the assessment at hand. Yeah, so I, I we believe that uh, when you give them uh, that instruction on how they are expected to to sit that assessment, then they know how they are supposed to go around about it. But but if you do not offer that, then it might affect. I mean, the outcome might not be guided. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to answer before we wrap this one up? Uh, Marisa, go. I mean, um, sorry, I know I've spoken a lot, but I was just saying this applies really going. well because <laughs> we have a we have chat, like a chat bot content um, with adult learners, yeah. and so basically um, we send them messages over WhatsApp and SMS. And we, in the beginning, we're trying to decide: do we just deliver like a whole lesson, or do we do like bite size and then have them request the next one so that we can know who's actually engaging with the content? But I think the other thing it does is it allows them to like break it down into chunks and say like, okay, I focus on this one and then I get another one. So it's not like a big overwhelming set of information all at once. I'm not sure if this is signaling, but that's what I'm imagining. Okay. okay. So um, what you're talking about, Dixon? Mm -hmm. 
circles and red arrows. Good job, Dixon. I wish you pay your voice, but yeah. <laughs> so you're all uh, sort of saying the same thing. The simplest form of it is what Dixon is saying. Like if you're looking at the screen right now, signaling is in bold and it's separated from the human's land base etc. So what we are saying here is it's not even complicated. Show me where I should be looking if you think it's very, very important. So for example, if here I wanted you to note the word pay attention, I could highlight it, I could circle it, I could put it in bold, I could, there's so many things I could do, but naturally the human eye will go where you draw attention to. So as much as you can where there's a lot of information, or not, even if it's not a lot of information, try as much as you can to use uh, all the things we have available to us, whether it's bullets and then after that, all the ways we have available to us to circle and do all those things so that, so that the, the learner is looking where you need them to because we when you're reading you mostly skim through things most of the time so you're trying to ensure that you're they're catching the one thing on the screen that you feel like they absolutely need to pay attention to amy um anything to add before we move to the next one i think if you start to look at really successful interfaces you'll see this one all over all the time i even think about um Google Maps and how they show me which are the main roads to follow. The main roads are in yellow and all of the other mm -hmm. roads are white. And so even if I don't have turn by turn directions, I still know, okay, if I get on this one, this is the way that takes me to, you know, farther away to where I want to go. So lots of interfaces use really good signaling. Um, in order to show you what to pay attention to if you don't have a lot of attention to pay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so eight, this one is easy, embodiment voice. So humans learn best from a human voice than a computer voice. Uh, but also Maya stresses that this, the research on this is still preliminary. So what we are saying is we are all now generating videos and there's a lot of AI options out there that you just type text and they give you a voice back. The thing is a lot of them still sound like machines even though we've moved um, We've moved significantly now to those who can even clone your own voice. If you give them, I think, uh, 500, you, if, you, if you speak 500 words, they'll send you back your voice. But it still sounds a bit off. Uh, I don't think anyone has cracked completely sounding like a human. But what we're saying here is if you're, if, if you're speaking to a human, you want to sound like a human. A computer voice is just going to dis distract uh, from the point of this. Amy, if you want to add something before I move on, please feel free to. Yeah, this one might change in the future as yeah, yeah. get better and better. Uh -huh. But for right mm -hmm. now, it, it's uh, it just distract, distracts a little mm -hmm. bit from the learning. It adds that a little bit of extraneous load on to listen to someone who's not a human. Mm -hmm. So the next one is embodiment image. We, ha we had a discussion, those who are here for the deep dive, you remember the discussion around the talking heads, the way we all, when the PowerPoint is talking heads or the eight thing, and then you do the corner where you're talking and then the arrows and then going from your head to the bottom, trying to explain things. So what we said the last time is you adding your face in the corner to what you're teaching does nothing cognitively for the person who's learning. It might look nice. You might like being on the screen, might do something for your brand. But for the learner, having your face in the corner speaking to them does not do much for their learning. Amy, before I move on, anything you want to add? Yeah, again, it's just it's similar to um, subtitles. If you have to divide your attention between the speaker and the slide, it, it can distract because your learner has to be looking in two different places. And then number 10, uh, segmenting. This one I'm going to give to Kidato. Segmenting is a very simple principle as the only thing to it is that you're breaking down large segments into smaller, your, it's what um, I think Marisa was trying to describe earlier where you're sort of chunking information up um, into biteable bite um, pieces so that you're, you're not overwhelming the learner. Kidato, uh, please. Yeah, you think, yeah, you're right, Marisa. Your example is this, it's segmenting. So Kidato, how are you doing this for your learners?
Yes, Doreen. I'm not from Loho. I know you're from Loho. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Go, go right ahead. Yeah, but I'll talk about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um. So while organizing our content, of mm -hmm. course, we're organizing it under strands and substrands, but um, under every strand, there's a number of uh, concepts that uh, a user has to learn or a learner has to learn. So we are segmenting our content in terms of concepts so that they have to learn one content concept at a time. Yeah, so that you're not presenting them with um, several concepts at the same time. We only present them with one concept at a time. That helps them to internalize what they're learning before they move to the next concept. Okay, um, Amy, I know you want to explain, but <laughs> I want us to move into the... Uh, Val, okay, Kidato is back. Explain and then we move to the next two before we get into an activity because we really need to do it. Sorry, yes, it's cool. It's cool. Thank you. It's cool. I think for us, segmenting is very easy because being a K-12 school, it means that we segment our lessons according to the year. So segmenting for us is very easy and very clear in that sense. Mm -hmm. But I've seen you segment further, say for your STEM, for example, how do you segment that? The segmenting in the STEM in the enrichment programs is also done according to, I won't say years, but according to ages and according to each level. Yeah. So you might find someone is, let's say, five year old, but they've been doing coding since they were three. So their knowledge level is a bit higher. So it depends on the level of uh, knowledge on the topic. And then also we try to segment according to age because uh, also you don't want to put someone like, let's say, for example, a 17-year-old in the same class with a five-year-old. So that's how we deal with it. Okay. Um, so as you wrap up the segmenting, we are talking about here, though, is more granular. So it's more about... Um, what Loho sort of described, where you have a topic and then you break it down into a subtopic and that, that subtopic goes into something else. It's just about making, uh, breaking down the information into chunks so that as I absorb it, then uh, of course the chunks, it shouldn't be too small that now it's too hard to relate it to the first thing that I was learning. So, but yeah, that's what segmenting is about. Um, I want to move to personalization. So according to the personalization principle, uh, having a more relaxed tone in an online class can actually positively impact learning. So that's just, um, let's see. You don't want to have some. Sure. Um, so this one is, um, related to the idea of embodying, so having a, um, a human voice instead of a computer voice, uh, personalization, things like saying, um, we are going to learn about physics principle number one instead of uh, physics principle number one is. Uh, those are two very different types of tones um, that you might take in your instruction. Uh, and the more relaxed, informal tone actually causes learners to pay more attention to what you're saying, to get more engaged with it, and also to increase uh, or support that germane cognitive load where they're integrating things with what they've learned before. Uh, so this one is about increasing or supporting that germane cognitive load processing uh, of the information with things that they've learned before. Okay, and then um, finally, pre-training. So people learn more deeply from a multimedia message when they know the names, characteristic, and the characteristics of the main concepts. Uh, so this one is we also describe. We, we've talked about this where uh, say you're trying to teach me about even a recipe, right? So uh, the there's the main concept. So uh, say we are trying to make lasagna the okay so there's a link that's been dropped don't open it yet uh so 
what we're saying here is pre-training means what information do I have to build on before you start training me on the main thing. So that could be vocabulary. Sometimes uh, you the thing. It could be help me build on the knowledge before I actually get into it. Anything that forms a uh, learning before I get to the actual training forms pre-training. Uh, Amy, I'll let you finish this one before we jump into activity, which is what we're doing next. Yeah, so you can even think about this presentation um, in which we talked about uh, intrinsic cognitive load, extrinsic cognitive load, and germane cognitive load. So we introduced those three terms at the beginning of this presentation, and then we're using them throughout the whole presentation. So that's an example of pre-training where you make you give your um, uh, definitions and you get, set things up ahead of time. Uh, before you move into the rest of the, the training. So that's a really simple example. Yeah. Um, so intersection, I think we will do as we do the feedback for this, uh, for the activity. So I'll skip through that a bit. It's just five points though. So we have a design activity for you guys. So each slide prompt, we're going to take you into breakout rooms um, automatically in a bit. So each slide prompt revolves around the theme of solar energy. Keep your designs consistent with this thing. So for each principle, you'll design two slides, one that shows what to do and one what not to do, right? So it's a good and a bad. So say, for example, you're showing me signaling, you'll show me what um, the same, the same, you're using the same information that you have on both slides. So this one is bad signaling, this one is good. So you fixed the bad one and this is what it looks like now and this is good signaling, right? And then uh, you can, we'll give you a blank slide, that's the link that's been dropped, you can make a copy. Uh, and then get images, graphics, whatever from the internet that it's just, it's, it's, it's just a practice exercise, you see overdo. Um, so yeah presentation at the choose someone from your team who's going to tell us what's good about the good one what's bad about the bad one uh yeah i see you're having access issues uh, it's being fixed i've seen the request so and then at the end of the activity in 20 minutes actually 20 is too many right let's say 15 and then i'll come at 15 and you let me know if if you need more time hopefully not uh, so yeah, you're about to be thrown into groups, decide who's presenting. Uh, I'm happy to see your slides in a bit. Joanne is working on it, so I'll see you shortly. Gilbert, we meet again here. Yes, I knew. I knew you were going to meet. <laughs> You're going to be the presenter. Ah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Sid hasn't has spoken in all that meeting. Sid should present. Ah, good. That, that, sounds, that sounds good. <laughs> I don't think I'm in the best position to present. <laughs> I think Rollings will just do it. Has anyone managed to get access to the the drive? No. Did you did you click it? 
Yeah, I clicked, but it was asking for permission. Oh, no, I haven't. Maybe we just click at the top and ask for help. Oh, it has now gone through. Mm. Do you yeah. mind sharing? Yeah, I've just shared. So we're doing one good slide for segmenting and one bad still for segmenting. I think I'll need some more clarity on the instructions. Did someone take notes or the instructions? Just remember it was something about solar solar energy. And then yeah, what, I took a photo of it. Each one says light revolves around the theme of solar energy. Keep your designs consistent with this theme. <laughs> So we need to make to keep that theme of solar energy. Okay. For each for each one, we'll, we'll design two slides. Uh -huh. One that is on the good implementation of the people. And that is there someone someone else? So Sid, please, uh, please mute. Oh, sorry, guys, sorry. Guys. Yeah, point number two says uh, slide creation. For each principle, mm -hmm. we design two slides. One that demonstrates a good implementation of the principle and one that shows a bad implementation. Right. Uh... Yeah, then tools and resources uh, use the blank slide uh, provided and the internet for images graphics and animations related to solar energy and then the final one is presentation at the end of the activity you'll showcase so i think you're right uh, rollins yeah and where is the provided uh... I, I think it's that oh, slide. Oh, you just you just work inside of this. Project. Yes, like, just uh, work inside that one. Hello, so guys. Maybe you can share it, Rollins. Then we just work on it. So hi, this is John. I'm coming to check if you need any support. Hi, John. Uh, hi. I've shared the link again on the chat, your group, uh, your group, group four. four. Yeah. Also, I want to steal one person. Group three only has two people. Who would like to volunteer to move to another group? I think we are fine here. Thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is your. <laughs> I want to take just one person. You're fine. Good slot speaker. Oh. You love to pick random, randomly. I'm going to pick Dixon. Dixon, uh, who has club. So Dixon, uh, I'll, uh, no, 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 no. Why are you taking Dixon? 
<laughs> he volunteered himself by his reaction. All right. So there's okay. a section where you can ask for help again. Just let me know in case you get stuck. That's fine. Okay, great. Thanks. Rollins, I think you can share the screen and then we just load in, we, we key in the information on the slide. And we have nine minutes to go. Rollins, are you there? Sorry, okay, let, let me share my screen now. I see, come on the other, on this PDF, there's someone here already, already typing some stuff. I don't get it, I'm a, I'm a, let's Oh, go. this is not you. Uh, which one? The one so, typing. Yeah. No, no, no that, that's not me. That's someone else. Okay, that's a bit confusing then. Oh, uh, my, my suggestion was uh, if we can just do it uh, up separately, then we just, uh, uh, when they are when we are ready, we just paste on the other. That, that, that also suffices. Hmm. Okay, so let me, let me share with the other title presentation. But I, I also want to share this link so that anyone can edit also directly on that. Uh, yeah. Anyone can edit directly on that link that I've shared. Let me change permissions, share. Dixon has... Okay. I can see him here. Yeah. I e internet yangu wenyewe iko na shida. Title presentation. Okay, uh, the, the, the link I've shared up, we can, we all have permissions to edit. Oh, so we're just focusing on segmenting alone? Yeah. Ah, good. Mm. We have six minutes to go. And it's segmenting. Seg uh, so should one of us uh, get the images so that we can, uh, we can upload or uh, how, we, how are we going that? Uh, I I think... Uh, so, first of all, you need to remember what segmenting was, and then uh, okay, let us see segmenting up. Everyone should be solar. What was segmenting? And it's what is it? Can I read? Uh -huh. It's a simple principle. Uh -huh. that as the only thing too, is that you are breaking down these large segments into smaller segments. Okay. So a bad example of segmentation. Do you mean I bad bad dot google dot com? Pia kama mtu aneza pata images pia, tunezanza kudownload alafu tuzi fix fix up.
ilikuwa solar energy right yes solar energy Badi meleta a very a very long answer. Uh, I uh, hmm? I don't know. I'm thinking on oh, the on the on the good one. Is, can we, are we able to get like one image that can be symmetrically like? Like so what you, the bird? you know the <clears throat> image you have on the bird example. Uh huh. If you can ha have the same image now split into. You know that we you split it like into two or into four, right? To explain the same thing. Yeah. So solar energy, we can have solar panels, the sun. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, okay. So on uh, solar, or what? Solar panels will be easy because I think they're everywhere. Yeah. So Onana bad gave me a bad example here, and then a good example down here. It even analyzed the lesson as poor segmentation because it does not break down the learning objective into smaller. And then here is an to improve the segmentation. So here too many words for. So tutafute hizi tutafute hizi images mbaya mbaya ah ndio ndio Na wana wametongezea 5 minutes. Yeah. It's ending in 5 minutes so. Okay, so this Unana he is both renewable. Sorry. Stanley. Yes, I'm here. Okay, what we are doing. Yes. To deliver the message on advantages of solar energy, 
Yes, advantages and disadvantages. Of course, we have written the advantages. We just dealing with the advantages. Yes. Because they want us to implement principle number three, number seven, which mm. is signaling. Uh -huh, yeah, signaling, yeah. Yes, and we are just supposed to show exactly what we want to deliver. Mm -hmm. So we now want to contribute on in the good slide and the bad slide. What are we supposed to add to the good slide? to direct the viewers on what we want them to understand. Mm. Then on the bad slide, mm. we will not add any feature that will direct them to what they are supposed to be going through. Okay. Let me not For example, if you look at this, the first slide, this is poor signaling, right? Mm -hmm. Madam Doreen, you're a little bit low. I'm, I'm saying, can you mm. see my screen? Yes, I can see the screen now. So this is where we're showing poor signaling. Mm. Um, and then on this other slide, we are mm. now giving good signaling where we are highlighting um, the parts we want the user to focus on. Mm. You get? Yeah, I get you now. Mm. So signaling is about drawing the user attention to specific parts of the content. Just note it down. Just down here. Do it everywhere. What? I think it's everywhere. It's also a main point. Like everywhere. Ebu, ebu, you need points, Zako. Wanaka, we can get a different one. At what a position for reduce reduce electricity bill. You can add more. Oh, yeah. so, okay, you can add one. Huh? Finding one that is wrong is a bit hard. Could you just take an image that is not labeled and then just add a paragraph? That's so it is. So say you just take one image. Who reduces? As minimum maintenance, it's both renewable and reduces. Uh, one with the uh, text. Okay. Uh, so you can see that. Okay. 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 The other one, it is plain. Uh, kindly wrap up. If you're done before then, you can join the main call as well. But after the two minutes, uh, the call will take you back to the main session. Okay. Even if you do that, you don't have to sit alone.
So we can we can now uh, create a paragraph explaining that, but not directly with the on the images here. Yeah. For advantages, we don't need any image to show that. For yeah. our principle, yeah. yeah. No, not even for the principle, like for the chosen to do advantages. So, see, the zoom is quite nice. We can see the zoom is quite nice. Image to show the advantages. For the law, I don't understand. The solar is absorbed. Welcome back, everyone. So uh, we'll start with group one. Please, whomever is presenting, go right ahead, share your screen, and then show us what the magic you created. Uh, thank you. I will, uh, I'm requesting Nuru to share her screen. Thank you. Let's, uh, Nuru, I give it to you so that you can explain what we have done. Okay, uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. So this was a really, it was shorter than we thought, and we got thrown out of our room before we even finished our sentences, but it's okay. So um, uh, <laughs> we were here, our task was actually to um, sort of create an example um, within the space of contiguity spatial. Um, which is where everything should be in close proximity when we're talking about words being close to the pictures or rather making the labels close to the picture so that it's easier for the learner to understand. And I think that taps in, it reduces the extraneous, um, extraneous uh, load, cognitive load. And so you can see, sorry, can you see? Um, we, we can. Okay. I'm going to slide from mode though so that it's bigger. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Okay. Two. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's better. And again, because the, the image we found didn't have very clear um, labeling, mm -hmm. but um, for this one, you can see that, in our opinion, this one is the correct way that uh, information should be presented to the learners because then um, the labels and the pictures are in close proximity. Um, here you can see um, how the solar sort of system not system, but the, the solar energy system works here. You can see that the, the labels are closed to um, each image or aspect of this image. So you can um, see there's the solar panel here that's labeled, you can't see it very well. And then there's a controller, battery bank, uh, converter, and then the meter, um, which now is kind of like the process of how the energy is gotten from the sun and then converted into electricity, which is in the house. But if you look at the second slide that we have here, it's a simpler version of what we've seen uh, in the previous slide. However, there are no labels here. And while it is so easy to assume that someone can just understand exactly how the cycle goes, um, it's not really that apparent to everyone. Um, but we did put in some in, um, write-up here of what really um, this picture is presenting. So um, this is not the correct one. Uh, but the previous one is. Yeah. Great job. And thank you, Nuru, for presenting. I love it. Uh, so we'll move to group two before we wrap up. So group two, feel free to go right ahead. Thank you. Just a minute, I share my screen. Okay. All right. 
Thank you. We did not uh, move very fast. Our principle was redundancy and says that human learn best with narration and graph uh, with narration and graphics as opposed to narration, graphics, and text. The theory here is that if you already have narration and graphics, then the text on top is just redundant. So from what we have here, uh, we, we did not have the narration part of it. So this one is um, correct. And on the other end, you can listen as I narrate, so you can relate to it because you did not have somewhere to record. So mm -hmm. uh, solar energy, energy is anything relating to the sun. Energy is power derived from the utilization of physical or chemical resources, especially to provide light and heat. Solar energy is light and heat from the sun that uh, is used in the generation of electricity and power. So from there, you can be able to learn that uh, you are listening more than you are reading because there was a narration. So that is not the correct part of it because we are not able to record. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Priscilla. Let's move to group three. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Dori. Yes, so in group three, mm -hmm. we were to speak under the principle of signaling. So we chose to focus on the advantages of solar energy. So we came up with uh, two slides. The first one that is on the screen is the one where we've implemented uh, all the requirements of that principle. If you look at the heading, solar energy has been highlighted to direct the learner's attention to what you want them to understand. Then under the main points, we've used bullets, which is supposed to direct the learners. And the key points, we've written them in bold. For instance, we find that solar energy reduce electricity bill solar energy is more then it requires minimal maintenance so the key points we place them in bold to be able to direct the learner as guided by the principles of signaling then on the bad side, we've made it to be plain such that the key features under signaling which states that human determines when they are directed and shown exactly what you want to give out. We've not indicated that in the bad slide. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, next group, please. Please stop sharing. Which number, which number was that, Tabitha? Sorry. They were group three, I think. So four now. Uh, I hope you guys can see my screen. Hi, everyone. Hey, please put it in slideshow mode. OK. So for group four, we were focusing on segmentation, where we we are supposed to show you how bad segmentation, uh, we are supposed to show you uh, bad segmentation to good segmentation. And we were focusing on solar energy. Uh, so for the bad example, we have this image alongside the 
it's a chunky text where whereby this learner won't be able to understand uh won't be able to understand how uh, the steps are to creating the solar uh, to fixing the solar panels and uh how the image is supposed to make the learner understand how the energy works. Uh, so for the next slide, which uh, we were able to add the steps, as you can see, the, the first image is the passive solar system versus the active solar system, where there are two examples of solar systems and how the energy is transferred to the, to the house. And we added steps. So you can see step one there. And for the last slide, we also added the, the images alongside the, uh, the steps, where you can see the step two and step three also. Yeah. Okay. And finally, row five. Um, I'm gonna point out that we had a little bit of ex, uh, external load, what is it, external? <laughs> Extraneous, yeah, extraneous um, uh, information going on because the instructions were not at the same place as where we were working, and we need to keep going oh back. Oh gosh! Oh gosh! <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Hold on, let me see if I can. Yeah. So, so because of that, we did it slightly different, <laughs> but I think we did a good thing. So, let me go through and present really quickly. Hold on. That's so we were great. thanks for sharing that example though. <laughs> I love it. Uh, let's see. I go here. Yeah. Um, and so we were looking at how others already kind of just like presented this concept of solar energy online. And we're trying to look at places where we thought personalization was done well and where it wasn't. Um, personalization here is according to the principle personalization principle, having a more relaxed tone in an online class can actually positively impact learning. So we're looking at personalization that way and just like how also that learning relates to you as an individual. Um, and so this was one that we thought looked good. Um, it has great images about how the, sol how the solar energy works with your home and very just simple information that is only relevant to like what you need to know as a consumer, not everything to know about solar power and solar energy. So it's very clear, it also uses great signals like this is the information we want you to look at first. This is the information we want you to look at second and so on. Um, and it's pretty simple. The language is really relatable um, and relaxed as it's saying. Then we have one that's like, hey, this is an okay example. It shows, um, you know, it has a lot of information. I don't know where to look first, but if I take a little more time, <laughs> this is a little bit more extraneous work going on here. If I take a little bit more time, then I can, get most of the same information, not even not even all the same information than the other design, because not that it doesn't tell me much about my bill. It just says a little bit about like, um, I think we're the meter, yeah, the metering. Um, and, and then that we thought this was a bad example because it's telling you about some of the same components, but I don't have any idea how that relates to me as an individual and it's very um, unapproachable, the language it's using and the design it's using. Marissa, I like even on your the previous slide, the middle example, you can see it says customers can choose between gross and metering. Whereas yeah. in your good example, the very first slide, it says your utilities meter measures the electricity you send. Yeah. So, yeah, this is it just seems like, yeah, there was like three layer, three levels of good to bad. Yeah, very um, nice. Great job, you guys. You took it very seriously. So much, so much research, even with our extraneous load on you. So um, I'm going to let Amy wrap this up with connecting the two. Yes, yes, all the clubs. And then we could take a brief Q&A before we wrap up. Amy? Yes. Uh... Thanks, everybody. So we've learned about a lot of things today in, um, uh, in the session on uh, how to manage cognitive load and then using that to support the um, 
design of interfaces using Mayer's multimedia principles, I think you have uh, really grasped the, the three main concepts, which is let's try to simplify the intrinsic cognitive load. So reduce the complexity of a topic by, um, by managing the cognitive load that, that inherently comes with it. Um, yep, bye everybody. We know some folks that we're gonna have to leave. Uh, you have learned how to reduce the extraneous cognitive load. So making sure that you're not adding lots of things that distract the learner or that take them away from the core learning that they have to do. And then the third important thing is increasing the germane load, which is helping them process the information better, connecting it better to what they already know, helping them to do that integration to get things into their long-term memory. So we've learned about managing our cognitive load, about simplifying our multimedia presentations. We've learned how to use that to build on our prior knowledge, guide the learner through things like signaling um, and reducing extraneous load and finally engaging learners in deep learning with that For those of you who can stick around, we're happy to stay here and take some questions. Um, and we can also always uh, collaborate with you in ongoing office hours if you'd like to use these principles and take a look at your own software. Thanks so much. Yeah, so anyone have a question that we could answer? If you want to do a ruling, did Alia and share something you want input on, we could stay back uh yeah so let me deal with the first thing first any questions comments anything okay great so we are happy to wrap this up thank you everyone uh thank you too francis Thank you everyone for joining and staying this Thank long. You. Please stay back for me. Got it, Priscilla. We're staying back for you. Everyone else, have a good rest of your day. See you soon. Ah, there. I see a hand up, Diana. Yeah, you can stay back too for us. Wow. Okay. Everyone else, have a great, great evening. See you soon. Bye. Bye, Gilbert, Dixon. Yes, Evelyn. Bye. Uh, bye, 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 bye. Sorry, it was by mistake. Bye, bye. Okay. okay. Cool. Thank okay, you, Dixon. Yay! Happy Thank to you, have you. Okay. Who wants to go first? Anyone with a question? Anyone with anything you want us to address? Priscilla? Yeah, go. Thank you. I was actually looking at redundancy points. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking from a point of um, someone who is able to differently. So uh, where I'm standing, I am tempted to think that if I'm creating content alongside someone who is able to differently, then I have to be specific so that I don't uh, create content that is uh, that involves everyone, that everyone can do, because that means if I am including everyone and I'm using the same content to ensure that even someone who is able to differently, it means that um, another learner might have the intrinsic cognitive load or extraneous. I don't know how to go about it. Maybe you can guide me through so that um, before I make that, I am able to know exactly what I'm supposed to do. Yes. Thanks, Priscilla. That's a great point. And a really important one uh, is that uh, in many cases, these principles are designed for 
neurotypical learners, for learners who are not differently abled, and we need to very much pay attention to what they mean for learners who are differently abled. And you picked out a exactly the principle that I think is most important there, the redundancy principle. So for instance, if you have a learner who is hard of hearing or deaf, they're not able to listen to the audio version of a presentation. And so for them, having the text is really important. Or for a learner who, for instance, is a new language learner and isn't completely comfortable in the language of the presentation. And so one of the things that we can do to make sure that presentations work for all learners is to have flexibility and personalization. So for instance, you can have uh, subtitles that you're able to turn off or turn on um, depending on your abilities. Um, the other thing that's really important there because even for learners who are hard of hearing and use only the visual cues, it's still hard for them to have a graphics or a video and then also In text mm -hmm. um, because you're still limited to processing only one of those things at a time. So mm -hmm. then it's important to be able to do things like pause the presentation or perhaps to have the transcript available afterwards, ways that will allow them to do that processing that they have to do, um, but while they're limited to only one uh, modality. So adding subtitles that are able to be turned on and turned off, adding the ability to pause or go slowly so that you can look at both, all of those things will help but they help more than just people who are deaf. They help people, as I said, who are language learners, who are uh, uh, having trouble with um, uh, that dual processing, who are less neurotypical. And so, yeah, I love that you're bringing up having that flexibility and, and making sure that we're uh, supporting all of those learners. Thank you. Thank you for that. And still, I'd still need to have a conversation with you and Tabitha after. Yes. Thank yes. You. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So that mm -hmm. would be a good topic for office hours, I think. Okay, actually. Um, Priscilla, could you, I'm sure you have, or someone in your department has the link for office hours. So you could actually book um, for any Wednesday. How's your Wednesday? Oh, this Wednesday? Yeah. Or for, uh, yes. Um, uh, well, we have to talk about specific We have times. to, I know. Yeah. But anyway, Priscilla, let me get back to you on that. Um, I'll give you slots. Let me talk to Amy and then we can align and then I'll give you slots. You can book office hours and then we can go from there. Thank yes, you, I appreciate His name is Singy Park. We use, okay, just a second. In Singy Park, we use a static teacher character whenever there is text with no relevant supporting image. Does this discourage learning according to the embodiment principle? Mm. No, good question, but mm -hmm. that should be okay because the issue with having the instructor there is that your attention gets divided. So you don't know whether to look at the instructor, you don't know whether to look at the material. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a static teacher, they're not, the learner won't be paying attention to that. So that's perfectly fine. Yeah, good yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question because it's not distracting. I mean, they look at the teacher, the teacher is not moving, they move on. It, yes. it really isn't. Yeah. Uh, anyone else with questions? Diana, is there anything you needed clarity on? Well, it was not really about a question or anything, it mm -hmm. was about the micro courses. Okay, uh, what yes. about them? Mm -hmm. Go. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ooh. When we were signing in, we found it's open, open. How is open? Do we have like exact time we are supposed to finish? Because I, in the email, I realized the certificates are already issued. And for us, like for virtual lessons, the last two months have been another 
work overload we were having so we did not manage to finish but we are there we are working on it so yes, yes so we, i was asking how open is open Yes, good question, Diana. And Priscilla, you, I see you sent an email with a similar question. So those yes. first two courses that are that you're enrolled in now will be open through the end of 2023. So you will have until the end of December to finish them. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good. And you should feel free to let us know if you need help with them. There are other office hours for the courses and we can help you move forward, but they'll be open to you for the next, um, yeah, two months. Okay. Thank you Great. for this, Mary. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else you guys need help with before we debrief? Okay, so reach out to me. Uh, you will have my email, Tabitha, that I have the CEO of KE. Um, I can book office hours, then me and Amy can tag team on anything you need support with. But uh, yeah, happy to end this here for everyone so we can plan for tomorrow's uh, session in Nigeria. So bye, everyone. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. bye. bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Dixon.